Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining me today on the last slot of the last day for secure code design practices. Before we get started, a quick shout out to our sponsors. Without their support, none of this would have been possible. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Fred. I'm a cloud solution architect working at Microsoft, most notably in the security team and related to PowerShell. So this is one of those topics that's been really dear to my heart, especially considering all the crimes against mankind I've seen out there in script files. I love gaming, reading, bartending, and bragging about my toys. So if you have been victim of a drive-by shooting of Pierce Framework advertisement, thank you for your patience. There are a few more about that. If you are looking into Active Directory security, I strongly encourage you to take a look at the ADMF project which it deals with that basically DC for Active Directory, but not the topic of today. What are we going to really look at? We are going to first establish some, con uh, some, uh, some assumptions and context, like what is this really focused on, because the security field is really wide. Going to cover a few of the fundamentals, to prepare some mental boxes to uh, put all of the things we're seeing into and a few additional recommendations. And then we are going to do lots and lots of demos with live examples, reasons why things go wrong, um, accidents we tend to stumble over, and a few live, experience, live examples of where the developer in the uh, tunnel view in us kind of messed with the security admin in us. So first of all, key assumption. You all have, um, at least for where you want to secure things, deployed constrained language mode. If you are not constraining um, what the attacker is allowed to do, they can literally circumvent every single security measure. They can hide from AMSI. They can hide from script log logging. If you give them free code execution, all of your security tools are not going to get anything useful. This avoidance does not require admin. As long as you can do custom code in PowerShell. Oops. So um, what we are not going to talk about how we prevent compromise of systems. We are not going to uh, talk about how we can prevent the attacker from using uh, privileges they already obtained. What we are going to look into how we can prevent the attacker from circumventing security measures, most notably by abusing the code we wrote ourselves. Because what happens when we do secure code management? We're saying only whitelisted signed code is allowed to run. So we, of course, are signing our admin code so we can run our admin code. But what if our own admin code is the security hole the attacker is using? T trying to avoid this is basically the key point of today's talk. So fundamentally, we are going to look into free aspects of this whole thing. The first one I'm, is going to be so obviously painful for many of us, secrets and privileges. Please don't put clear text credentials into script code. Please don't. We are also possibly, depending on how far we're going, uh, going to look into how we can uh, write our code so that we don't need as many privileges. If we don't get that far, just enough administration is a great tool for that, as are function apps for the cloud. Um, verify data, validate your input, make sure that the data that you are receiving is the data you should be receiving and should be using. And finally, code trust. Make sure that you don't accidentally have code that is trusted, be untrusted, or the other way around, have take code that is untrusted and accidentally make it trusted. That last one is surprisingly easy to do. And since we usually don't validate that, well, too bad. General advice. We won't be going into this because most of those topics are very much... Um, sessions of their own. But please write clean, reliable code, readable code. VS Code has an auto format function, helps a lot with that. Mind your indentation, readable names, all that stuff. Document your code, implement secure code management, because if every attacker can just grab your certificate, code signing kind of loses meaning. So 
take care of that. Do your versioning so you can actually realize that you have a secure version deployed and the broken version is no longer in the field. Then proper package management and, well, do your code signing. That's it. You survived the PowerPoints. Let's delve into things. First of all, we have this credentials, topics of the secrets and the clear text I want you to not do. You're seeing nothing. This is not what you should be seeing. <laughs> yes. Uh, is this large enough or should I be increasing things more? We can do that. Better? Or one more? We kind of running into problems here, but we can still manage. <laughs> Barely. Okay, so um, everybody's heard it said, everybody's seen it, but um, this is, please, uh, please don't do this thing. There are ways to not suffer this fate. We've had that's so many compromises where some admin scripts had credentials or client secrets in there that shouldn't belong there. I had a customer recently who literally leaked a client secret that had global teams administrator permissions with directory read write all. I mean, you can give me the keys to your castle, but it's probably not something you should be doing. And it's surprisingly often how admin scripts are readable in a share. And please don't. <laughs> so there are different tools around us. We are not going to delve into too many, but we are going to establish the least common thing that everybody has access to. And there's something called export CLI XML. It is absolutely pure magic compared to clear text credentials. It allows you to use get credential to ask for credentials, which are going to be absolutely top secret. And then it, I'm writing that to a file. And if I now try to read this file in a text editor, you will notice that the password is slightly longer than what I typed just now. It's encrypted. It can only be read by the same person on the same machine. So that makes uh, the barrier, raises the barrier a lot for the attacker to actually be able to use them and reduces the risk. So do that. And in our code, we could then just at the beginning use the credentials if import CLI XML, read it, and well, then do something with that. Of course, I'm not trying to not restart my presentation machine during the demo, so I've got a little interrupt in here. But that will do the job. Now, there is just one problem with this whole thing, and that is often enough we are needing the credentials in a, for a different user than our user. Let's say I'm setting up a scheduled task to run on a system. So encrypting that file as system it might prove a little bit of a challenge, which is why I have provided a little script in my GitHub that does the job for you. You can find that, that and many other snippets under my thread snippets repository. They're standalone capable. You can manually review that without needing tens of thousands of piece framework code reviewed. So that's completely standalone. And it allows you to specify what computer, what are the credentials, where do, or do they need to go? So that's uh, a helper for that, of course, mostly focused on making this work in your more on-prem environment. But in the cloud, we have other options anyway. Next option that I can strongly encourage you, we are not going to go through the demo here on that, but there's this thing called secret management, the PowerShell module by the PowerShell product group, which supports ex with extensible plugins integration into all kinds of credential management solutions, such as the Azure Key Vault or many other commercially available solutions, depending on what plugin you trust and want to use. So there are conference recordings on that. There are resources on that. It's on the PowerShell gallery. Go and have fun with that. Now, though I'm kind of a Microsoft engineer, so I probably should at some point be pitching some kind of Microsoft product. So the Microsoft native solution for this would be the Azure Key Vault, where we can provide code to. Of course, now the problem is how the hell do we get the credentials out of that key wall? Because that's not quite intuitive in many cases. Because if you want a certificate, get AC key wall certificate is the wrong command. 
which kind of threw me a screwball for a little bit. So uh, again, I'm not going to properly demonstrate this, but the idea is we are doing a certificate on our task runner, assuming we're having an unattended script that we're trying to unblock. If a certificate, the task account has access to the private key, can use that to connect to Azure and is granted permission under the service principle to the key vault. And I have some sample code on how we get a certificate or plain credentials, password, username, username, password from the key vault. So if you later want to look this up, this is all going to be on my GitHub uh, ready to access and review. But yeah. So secrets. That's it. I'm not going to talk more about secrets. I'm pretty sure most of you have that already handled because I think most of the attendees in the conference are kind of proactive about good practices and this is a fairly obvious one. There is one evil command that I'm seeing frequently in the field which is often used and almost never needed. Invoke expression. Invoke expression allows us to, well, build code from string and execute it. Now, if you're saying, I'm not using invoke expression, I'm using script block create, that doesn't make you better. It makes you better hidden. But it doesn't change the problem that dynamically creating code that we're executing is a problem from a code signing perspective. And it also means that we are in risk of the PowerShell equivalent of a SQL injection. Let's do a simple example of where we're using it wrongly. I'm trying to use NSLOOKUP. And this lookup has this nice parameter for computer name and for a server which, with which we may select the DNS server to use. We may specify it or we may not, depending on what we're doing. So I'm building the command string. And if the server was provided, I'm also adding the server as a string. And then I invoke expression, this whole thing as NS lookup. This is going to work. Perfectly fine. There could never possibly anything go wrong with that. Works. Works still. And finally, this also works. Great, we got a DNS result. Well, there might have been some slight surprise in there, but it still worked. Now, the problem is if we are now registering this as safe code, the attacker could provide an untrusted script block and invoke expression is going to execute trusted code because the command it's called from is trusted. Slight problem here. So there is, for this particular scenario, a very simple solution. It's called splatting. Yes, splatting for external application, it exists. Again, something we don't usually encounter because it's almost unknown. The key difference for splatting with external applications compared to PowerShell is that we don't have parameters in the way the parameter binder and PowerShell knows them. So we don't use a hash table. We use an array. It's exactly the same otherwise. And with that, well, we can provide some input and it's going to work and it's going to work. And we are going to have some question about this name. Because now the provided code wasn't executed, it was treated as string, problem solved. Of course, this assumes we actually can do this and don't have some weird situation where we actually do have to use invoke expression. If there actually is some reason, I don't wouldn't know which one, but I'm not going to execute the possibility. There is a, a good answer to this, actually, and it's, we're calling it input validation. If we are forbidding uh, code, uh, input that is not part of what we expect, it becomes a lot harder to escape this. So, same command, but now I'm using a validate pattern here which basically says the entire string that you're providing must be a letter, must be a number, underscore, dash, or dot. Any other character is forbidden. And with that, uh, injecting PowerShell code becomes a lot harder because I really like to see how you could do a full escape with that. With that, we never relied on the external application doing the job. Problem solved. If we don't want to go with, if we only allow this, but we are trying to, because we're not quite sure what characters are actually provided and necessary, again, might be some edge cases there. We could switch around the validation and say, okay, I'm explicitly forbidding those characters most usually needed to do code injection, which is again the same command. 
Only this time, we do a list of characters like dollar, parentheses, curly braces, quotes, and blacklist those with the, with this regex thing. Just trust me, this reverts, reverse, basically, there's not the characters in here. So, fire, ouch. We still have the problem that illegal host names would be allowed. So now com was our DNS server, which ah, might work, might not work, depending on what we actually put in there. So this is no validation about what would be a legal host name, but it definitely prevents most attacker code injection options here. Problem with that also solved. But ideally, we would, of course, have some pattern that is specific to the use case. So let's have some validation pattern for a legal computer target for DNS resolution. Yes, I took some time to write this. No, I don't want to dissect it again. But it works. Ah. <laughs> so let's see about that actually in the field. Um, the first one, validation works. The second one absolutely won't be legal. Um, white space in here doesn't work. White space in the host name is just a no-go. No um, doesn't find it, but it's okay. Legal name. This is not going to work because every single segment in a DNS name can't be more than 63 characters. And what about this one? Well, it's legal. Just couldn't resolve it. There is a point where regex kind of fails. This is obviously a wrong IP4 address, but it's a perfectly legal DNS name. Numeric top-level domain, whoever does that, please see help. But um, technically, it's not wrong. So um, regex has its limits. What it also has as a limit is, um, uh, yeah, Windows PowerShell thing. This nice explanation of what the error means, doesn't this error message property that allows us to override the default error message does not exist in PowerShell 5. So uh, this is cost of syntax error. So let's leave away the custom error message. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the user experience could go wrong. So I do have a solution for that, but that brings us back to this Fred bragging about his toys thing because there is actually a PSF validate script and a PSF validate set that both support custom error messages in both languages. In both versions, five and. Uh, 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 five and seven. So this here, well, PSF validate pattern would work just as well in Windows PowerShell. So, yeah, please don't do this with invoke expression. Don't dynamically create code if you can somehow help it. Prepare scripts that you execute, have parameters that allow you to work around this, but please don't dynamically do this. And if you really literally can't get around this, be absolutely hellishly detailed in your validation and rather for a bit too much than too little. So, scope trespassing. We've got secrets. We have in-book expression covered. One of the classic PowerShell misbehaviors is the so-called scope boundary violation. I've got a script. There's a function in there, and that function just kind of reads the variables from the script scope because it's convenient. We could use parameters, but that takes extra coding. Please use parameters. Don't access the super boundary from a purely debugging perspective. But there is also another example, and this relates security. I've got this command. And if I provided an import path, I'm going to import a user list from a CC file. And then I'm probably going to do something with this. At some point, I'm going to do a for each user in users, which is perfectly safe. If, I mean, if I didn't use the, do the import CSV, there's not going to be there and the for each loop never runs. So that's, well, safe, isn't it? I didn't provide the import parameter. But now, PowerShell fell back, fell back because the variable doesn't exist in the function scope and looked in the parent scope, which might include the global scope, 
which in an untrusted console could pro could include untrusted data that now is from treated by us as trusted data for most processing purposes because we assume we know what's in that variable and where the information came from. So um, even so, what's in here? I of course prepared some demo data in there in my PowerShell profile, so it survives these code crashes. Yeah, uh, the simple solution is adding uh, users in front of it. Uh, declaring the variable with an empty array. Now it, it, the variable exists, whether there's content in it or not, the variable exists in my function scope. And I will no longer accidentally uh, look in superior scopes for the data if it doesn't exist in ours. Not much of a complication, but the thing is with PowerShell, we um, don't run into errors most of those times because PowerShell is kind of lenient and convenient. But there's a risk of that for accessing exactly variable scopes here. All right. We have now accidentally used data from the global scope. So far, that's okay. Because global scope still means the attacker somehow got code execution. But let's look into a field example of data hygiene and decision-making quality. So we have, yes. That the node was no output. Yes, since I now have a user's variable in the function scope, it's empty. So the for each loop will run exactly zero times. Um, we're safe on that front. Okay, story. We have a modern IT environment, Intune managed end devices, Defender for Endpoint Security, and sometimes we find this thing where people still install old legacy software. And there's a security finding about that, and we want to solve this. So there's this thing called live response. I can deploy a script to run on the target machine, and that script is then going to go ahead and uninstall old versions of this application. I've got a trimmed down, simplified example. It's not a full code. But basically, we are looking for those applications. Don't bother, wonder where that comes from. That's as part of the code that I trimmed away. We are looking for everything that is older of that application, like let's say an old Firefox version. And then we are going to, for each of the application we found, we're going to uninstall it. How do we look for this? We look in, under HKLM and the uninstall paths, get the registry keys for that, and get that information from there. So, uninstall, a few options, but since the string location, how that is, could conveniently be handled with this invoke expression thing we talked about already. It does the job, MSI exec, also a nice one. So, we are using that uninstall string, and it's good. It's gone. Now, there's this one problem, and that is there are quite a few applications that users install into user mode, not under the machine, because they don't have local admin rights. VS Code, again, lots of browsers support that. And that information is stored somewhere else. So let's go ahead. Same script again. The only thing we change here, we're running a system, so we need some fiddling because we don't can't use HKCU, current user. Instead, we just use under HK users, all users, and looking for those keys and then continue. And it works. We add some technical problem because the uninstaller is going to try to remove the register keys from the wrong, wrong profile, but we can manually fix that. Not a problem. But we just invited ourselves a slight security problem. Our monitoring looks for H software by those uninstall keys. And the attacker can write to HKCU without elevation as a standard user. And they can provide their own uninstaller, which is then kindly being executed a system. We have a significant privilege of escalation situation here. Um, yeah, that's a problem. We didn't check, but we didn't validate this trustworthiness of the information we're operating on. So what can we do? 
how can we still solve the problem without, well, completely exposing ourselves? There's no really perfect answer, but one thing we can do is we can get out the uninstall path from the uninstall string to the application, check for code signing against a code signing certificate we pre-configured, pre like look for the subject in the certificate and it must be trusted. And then provide our own uninstaller arguments rather than relying on what is provided in that uninstall string. With that, we can somehow work around that by still verifying the integrity of the executable that we're executing. But I won't lie, won't lie, this is a lot more fiddly than I would prefer. But there is no really perfect solution here. But we need to somehow establish the trust of the code that we're executing, and that's pretty much the only way. So there's a full script by the kind author who provided was willing to share that. So you can find that in the materials on the GitHub. Everything you're seeing here in VS Code is going to be in my GitHub after the session. So time for the last major point, and that is messing with script blocks. Script blocks are a great thing. We accept them for parameter, for filtering. We use them for, for each loop. We use them for many things, and they provide value to us. There is, unfortunately, a lot of fiddly bits in there that can kind of surprise us. Let's start with the language mode thing. I can use dollar execution context dot session state dot language mode to figure out what is my current language mode. Now, for a trusted script block, that would be cons would be full language. For an untrusted script block, that should be constrained language mode. Now, there's just this annoying problem that this information is not on the script block, at least nowhere where we can see it, because this is a private property on the script block. So, we, if we want to verify this, we need to use reflection as the sharp ability to look at information that the developer didn't want us to see. Since I'm a curious fellow, that hasn't really stopped me in a while. So, there is a property on a script block about language mode. Let's take a look at an example script that we're going to execute. I'm going to define two script blocks. One before I change from full language to, to constrained language. Then I'm changing to constrained language mode and defining the second script block. This should be a non-trusted script block now. And then we are executing the code and verifying with using get private property what the language mode is on that script block. So, it was worked exactly as desired. The script block we defined in full language had full language mode. And the script block we defined after switching it to constrained language mode had constrained language mode. The uh, one important bit to take away here is that the language mode of the script block is independent of the language mode of the execution context they were designed in after initial creation. It, it's copied on creation, but it's independent of that, which means we can execute untrusted script blocks even for our own code is trusted. We just can't dot source it. That's just going to fail. So, now what I'm going to do is going to send the script block to a background run space and execute it there. Because, you know, performance, I want to multi thread. Let's roll and do this. What we're doing here is, again, define constraint language mode and then provide this untrusted code to a background run space. That background run space is going to do its own script block. It receives our code as an input argument, and we are ultimately executing the code in the background run space. So, a background run space is in the full language mode. The script block we provided to the background run space is in constrained language. Again, it's a property that is copied, copied on, onto the script block. So we're trying to execute the script block. It believes to be in constrained language and trying something it actually was in constrained language. All is well, right? It works as designed. Now, if only there were not a small Easter egg hidden in here. 
We call it Runspace Affinity. What I'm going to do next as an additional extra, I'm going to write the ID of the run space the code is executing in. And I'm going to do it at the beginning. And the script block is also going to return that as part of its output, what was my run space. Oh, my background script block was executed in run space ID number one. That is the main foreground run space. Oops. So I have got 100 background run spaces in parallel trying to execute the code and all 100 run spaces are going to send their code to the main run space whenever that is happy to go again and do the job again. So we are basically eliminating parallelism here. Problem? There's a solution. Um, Bruce Payette's session on closures. Great thing. There's a way to, well, wrap the script block into a new closure. So let's do that. What we are going to do here is one thing different. I'm going to ask it to create a new closure in the background run space. Looking at that, what it's going to do here is it's going to call the new clo get new closure method and replace that. Oh, look at the language mode of a script block. Isn't that great? It's now running and runs back in the background run space as we want it. But it is now trusted code. Even though it was provided by the attacker. Too bad. Now, if the only there were a way to fix that, since we have that behavior, we don't really need all the... the uh, the run space complexity, that's just the main use case where we need the new closure because we kind of need to migrate it into the current run space so we don't have the run space affinity problem. But the same thing happens when we do this here. This is going to call new closure. Get new closure. It's going to call that. So the same thing happens in the foreground run space. It's now in full language mode. Now, there is an answer to that. We are going to do the same thing again, only there's a different command doing the new closure. And what that command does, it cheats. We are reading the old language mode, copying the uh, code into a new closure, and then we are writing the language mode of the new uh, script block to have the same value as the original script block. And with that, our code now runs under the same language mode as the original code, even though we reset the session state, the context that it's now running in the local run space. And it didn't work anymore as a intended. All right. We are a bit over time. Thank you for your patience. Questions so far? I have got a few more samples in case we're running out of questions. There's a question, yes. Okay, the question was uh, if the attacker could actually switch back from constrained language mode into full language mode by rewriting that language mode property? And the answer to that is no. He can't unless we actually expose set private property. If you expose the command set private property as a, as a public command anybody can use that is trusted, yes, that would be a horrible, horrible idea. Please don't do that. Because that literally allows the attacker to completely remove the language mode. But as long as you don't do that, if they need to actually write to a property, they can't because in constrained language mode, you cannot write to properties. You can only read from them. So unless you expose that PowerShell command, you can't use it for, an, you can't escape because the properties required for that are not writable for you. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. I don't have a question, but actually, if 
possible to also verify IT before addresses we are like at if you're interested in Oh I um the IP uh, the regex thing I do have the full IPvV validation in there. The problem is it's in an or it's an or combination with the DNS validation, and the DNS validation says yes, no matter what the IP for. Okay, let's eliminate a few tabs and move on. So, oh, I accidentally didn't get the header right. Okay, can we? trust our data. There's an interesting thing in PowerShell. There's an validation attribute that has been added, but has somehow kind of disappeared in the uh, in anonymity because nobody knew about it and also because of its limitations. It's called the validate trusted data attribute. This is a validation attribute that is supposed to verify that the information it is receiving comes from a trusted source. This attribute has its limits, and we're going to be looking at them in a moment. So we have a test script for that. I'm declaring a variable with a value. Setting the language mode to constraint language, declaring a second variable with the value. And then I'm going to use this command and try to pass that value to it by providing value one, value two, and a literal 666. Remember, at that point in line number 16, we are in constraint language mode. So... So it didn't like the second variable because it was defined in constraint language mode. But it did take the literal. So this has some usability, but uh, obviously as long as the attacker can provide a literal value rather than a variable, this validation attribute is not going to work, which is one of the reasons it's kind of got lost. So it, it should never be the only validation you rely on, but it can be an additional block to insert. All right. Code signing. Um, please, please, please do code signing when you can as part of secure code management. But even if you can't do code signing, write code that is code signing compliant, something you actually can usefully code sign later on. Because otherwise, if you one year down the road finally have secure code management and now you need to get your code signing, you have a bit of technical depth to go through and we all know how eager we are about going back over our old code. And there is a very simple aspect to that for most of a coding that makes it code signing incompliant, and that is hard-coded values. If you write data into your script, even if they are not secret, you need to modify the script file every single time you need the script for a slightly different scenario. In this case, lock rotate. Uh, whenever we want to use the lock rotate script for a different path, we would now need to edit the file. This is bad for a variety of reasons, but code signing is one of them. So, um, instead, the same thing could have been a slightly improved script with a bit of documentation, parameters, input validation, and actually executing it afterwards. So, implementing parameters and preventing any need to dynamically create or to modify scripts is something I would strongly recommend based simply due to code signing already. So, there's this other thing we're seeing. We want to roll out constraint language mode, but we don't know what scripts are going to break. I mean, it, it would be nice if you could just flip the switch and it's good, but there's so many applications using a PowerShell under the hood, whether it's SCCM, Intune, uh, some other software packaging, even MSI packages have been known to use PowerShell scripts. Will they be, will they be affected? And, well, we don't know. But there has been a recent addition to Windows Defender Application Control that allows us to do a test run 
where event log events are generated. So there is now finally a tool for that to detect things in the field. But there is also a command written by yours truly that will take the path of a script and verify whether it would run in constrained language mode or not. Because constrained language mode doesn't mean PowerShell doesn't work. It just tries to limit what an attacker can do, but there are still legitimate use cases that will work in constrained language mode. So even if your Intune script is going to be under constrained language mode, that doesn't mean it fails. It just means it's under constrained language mode. Language mode. So there are a few things you can't do in constrained language mode. One of them is PS custom object. The other one is assigning to properties. And it's also not going to be happy about methods, even though steppable pipelines are absolutely awesome to writing CSV files without having to open it again and again and again. Steppable pipelines, not going to go into that here too much. Just it's a way to have a portable pipeline that you can pause and continue whenever you care to. Very handy. So this is probably not going to be work. Not going to work. So there's this test CLMM compatibility. And it or provides us the findings what everything would not work here. So with this, you can go through a script and see would this actually apply. Let's do the same code again, only with constraint language mode compatibility. The first thing is what did we want to do is if we are going to create a custom object in some way, we want to pre-calculate the values with variable assignments. So we only assign the property on the object creation and don't have to do a property modify later on because that's going to fail. PS custom object doesn't work. New object PS object does work. So this whole thing is doing the same thing, only without the constraint language mode problem. It will run just fine in constraint language mode. So... No findings, everything is fine. Again, you will find test CLM compatibility in the thread snippets repository or in the materials of this workshop. When we are building workshops, uh, well, <laughs> when we are building modules, there are a few guidelines. We are not going to delve through everything. But um, my strong recommendation Merge all of your script content into the PSM1 as part of the build. First of all, some security mechanisms aren't too happy about loading too many files. It gives you a performance improvement. So that's also, it also makes it easier to code sign. So that helps. Uh, obviously, don't use dynamic files, dynamically created files, because code signing can't work with that. And also, um, never write to the module folder. There is also one more hard rule that is a PowerShell best practice already anyway. But here it's a technically enforced thing. And that is the functions to export. In functions to export, we could have this nice wildcard here. This is convenient. It also means that if your module is trying to load a second file other than the PSM1, it is going to refuse import in constraint language mode, even if you whitelisted that module. So at this point, import is going to fail, even though everything else was done as expected. You should never have done this anyway. Instead, explicitly list all of the commands that you were going to use expose. There is a command called update module manifest. You can dynamically update this property on your, as part of your build script before you're publishing, publishing it publicly or internally. So there is really no reason to have a wildcard here. So don't do that. So, yeah, final quick mention. We had this at the beginning. Least privilege, you can build your code to require less writes. Don't ask for directory read all. Ask for the scopes you actually need in your graph requests. Don't use domain admin when a regular user would do. You can, in often many cases, uh, solve the problem with the correct delegation rather than overfeeding privileges to your code. However, if you just need many privileges for the solution to work, you can still gate them behind some control mechanisms, such as just enough administration for, well, 
VinRM-based remoting. I had, did a talk on that on the last PSConf EU, so that's a recording on how to apply that. There's a great tool with, written by Miriam with my contributions. And I also have one more module that is mostly unknown, roles, which allows us to do fine-trained role delegation in a just enough administration scenario. Where you can, for example, pro uh, assign privileges on objects rather than commands. For function apps, they solve the same problem in a cloud scenario because we can define a function app with an HTTP trigger, allow users to call the HTTP trigger and assign the rights to the function app rather than the user. So we can do that. And for those who weren't aware, function app HTTP triggers can be put behind Entra authentication. So it doesn't have to be an API token. You can actually do a full delegate workflow with browser, MFA, FIDO keys or whatever. Yeah, thank you for your patience. Are we over time? Hope you had a great conference. I certainly did. And see you around with the community demos.